Good morning. Beautiful day this morning, chilly. May get some snow. Let's have a word of prayer. Our eternal Father, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for life that you have given us. We thank you, O Lord, for the many blessings in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who died upon Calvary for the remission of our sins, and we ask that you will forgive us of our sins and strengthen us in our faith. We pray, O Lord, for those who are sick. We ask that you will lay thy healing hand upon them. And we pray, O Lord, for those who have lost loved ones, that you will comfort them. We ask, O Lord, for the infilling of thy Holy Spirit as we study thy word, that you may lift us, you may guide us and strengthen us. We pray, O Lord, be with our nation, a nation that has backslidden, that has fallen from thy grace. We pray, O Lord, that they may repent of their sins and come to know you as the Lord and Savior. Lead us and guide us, for it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Abraham sent his trusted servant, Eliezer, to get a wife from his son. He wanted a, a woman to marry his son, but he did not want one from among the Canaanites that he was around, so he sent his servant Eliezer to his own family. And this is the same Eliezer that Abraham was aiming to adopt. You remember when Abraham and Sarah were without children and God had promised them a son and they, their patience gave out and they were going to adopt him as their son so they would have an heir and God said, no, no you're not because I will provide a son for you. Can you imagine Someone coming to your house and wanting you to leave your home, leave your family, and go to a strange land and marry someone you haven't seen or don't even know. So when we cast our eyes on Jesus, we must take them off, off worldly things. We live in this world but we must not become a part of its evil ways. But sadly, many do. In Genesis, the 24th chapter, 61st verse, it says, Then Rebekah and her maids arose, and they rode on the camels, and followed the man. And this was Eleazar. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. So Rebekah made a choice. Her father and Eleazar had made an agreement between themselves that Rebecca would go back and she would marry Isaac. But Bethuel, the father, asked his daughter, said, do you want to go? And she said, yes, I'll go. So she was going to marry a man she didn't know. And I can imagine the question that she may ask, well, what did he look like? Was he ugly, or was he good looking, or was he just so-so? Was he tall and lean or short and fat? Was he bald-headed or have a full head of wavy hair? Maybe she didn't even give us a thought. Perhaps she never thought of this, of any of these things, because she was inspired by the Holy Spirit. You know, when God works in our hearts, and ask us to do something or go somewhere, many times we go. Sometimes we don't want to go, but we're forced to sometimes. But here she was. She was going to fulfill God's sovereign will, and she didn't even know it. She didn't know what was ahead of her. Had no idea that she would become the mother of a great nation. So the Lord not only furnished Rebecca the grace to say yes to Eleazar, but he also furnished the transportation to take her to Isaac. Back in those days, they rode camels. They didn't have cars. 
They're going to count as a dump. So Rebecca was to ride, not lead, the camel. Her load was to rest upon the camel. The Bible says, casting your cares upon him. We are to let Christ lead us through his holy word and his spirit. We are to cast our cares upon him. And in the 62nd and 63rd verse, we find now Isaac came from the way of Be'er Leo Roi, for he dwelt in the south. And Isaac went out to repentate in the field in the evening, and he lifted his eyes and looked, and there the Campbells were coming. Somehow, God drew Isaac from his home to go to a place, the same place, where Hagar had encountered the angel of the Lord. The place remains unknown today, but he was in the right place to meet the caravan returning with his fiancée. Perhaps Isaac himself was in prayer contemplating the circumstances of his life and hoping the steward would not return without his bride. Perhaps he also was wondering, was she good looking? Or was she not? And hoping that she was not ugly. Perhaps he was praying for this or perhaps not. We don't really know. But we know that he was out there in the field contemplating, praying after the loss of his mother. His mother had recently passed away and he was in great sorrow and we find that the camel is also a wiener so the camel carried Rebecca away from her family and home Jesus said except you forsake father and mother you cannot follow me we must be willing to face forsake all others and follow Jesus we must be willing to forsake the world and ourselves and follow Jesus. We must never look back to our old lives, always looking forward to our heavenly home. What wonders about Rebecca? Was she like Lot's wife? Did she stop and look back, or did she keep her eyes forward, straight ahead, as we should? As I said, keeping our eyes always fastened upon Jesus. And we find that the camel has an unusual nose. Out in the desert, he can smell water if there is any around. The priest in the Old Testament who had a broken nose was rejected. So become a priest, you had to have a nose that was, had not been broken. And we should be attuned to the needs of others and help them get spiritual rest. Through Jesus Christ. And we find that the camel has a cushion rim around the hooves. This enables the camel to walk on the sand without sinking into the sand. The Christian is cushioned by the Holy Spirit so that we can walk above the world and not sink down in it. 1 John 2 15 says, If any man love the world, he is not of God. We need the cushion of the Holy Spirit around us so that we will not sink into the quagmire of sin in the world. And the camel is known for its long, sharp teeth. When he is not out in the desert sands with nothing to eat, he can reach into the horny cactus bushes for food. And Jesus said, I have meat that you know not of. One of the problems that Jesus encountered when he was out proclaiming the word and talking about here he was the meat that they were to partake of him, people did not understand what Jesus was saying. They did not understand that he was talking about the spiritual meat, not the physical meat. And many turned their backs upon him. And we're seeing in the world today, there are many in this world who are going about in their own lives, doing what they want to do, acting the way that they want, without God. We must sink our teeth into God's meat, 
his holy word. Second to Timothy, we find these words that is to show thyself a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What it is saying that you and I are responsible to know what God's word is. When we stand before God and we are asked, or maybe not asked, but we know that when we stand before him, that we have no excuse. If we haven't studied God's word, that we can say, well, I didn't know. Paul made a state, statement one time. He said, I did it out of ignorance. And what he was talking about when he was out crucifying and killing Christians, persecuting Christians, that he thought he was doing right, but he found out when he came face to face with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus that he was indeed ignorant of God's law. But he said Jesus Christ forgave him of his sins. And we find that even today, when we stand before God, if we truly repent of our sins, there's only sin that He on only one sin that He will not forgive us of, us, and that's blasphemy the Holy Spirit. But we can be forgiven if we we're remorseful and repent. And we find that the camel has two tanks or two humps to carry water in for a long, hot journey. And when these run out. If he goes far enough and long enough and finally the water in the, the humps go out, there are still some water reservoirs in the lining of his stomach. And these pouches are released when the humps run out. There is more than enough water to carry the camel across the desert. Jesus supplies our spiritual needs, our spiritual water to quench our spiritual thirst. Grace has brought us this far, and grace will take us home. We're living in a time when people are in turmoil. We're living in a time when people have turned their backs on God. We're living in a time when our nation is divided, full of hate. And we find that in Galatians, the Bible tells us that those who hate will never enter the kingdom of God. Our problem is that we do not know what the Bible says because we don't read it. We don't have time for God. We don't have time for God's word. We don't have time to read and understand what God has planned throughout the time. But we have time for everything else. We have time to go to the movies. We have time to watch TV. We have time to go to the store. We have time to go out and play golf and, and bowl or whatever. But when it comes to God, we find that there isn't enough time in our schedule for Him. And then when things go bad, we cry out. For God. It is strange as we look at our times today and we listen to those politicians who claim that they are Christians and yet don't even know what the Bible says. Rebecca had to make a decision. You and I have to make decisions every day. When we get up, women are more prone to this than men. Men just get up and throw things on and go. Women got to figure out what I'm going to wear is this dress goes with that or these pants go with this. But we make decisions. And a lot of it is automatic. You, you know, you don't realize that in our minds, our, our brains are programmed. That when we do things, it's done automatically. We don't even think about it. When you walk, you want to go somewhere, 
your brain automatically tells you to put one foot out and the other foot and keep on walking. So you get where you're going. And there are times when we have to stop and decide for ourselves. What is it that I'm going to do? What is it that I must do? What is it that God wants me to do? Years ago, I was talking to a man, and we were talking about praying and, and prayers being answered. And I made this remark. I told him, I said, you know, you have to be careful when we pray. He said, what do you mean? I said, you may be praying for something and then all of a sudden you get the inspiration to do something and you say, well, that's sort of a little bit offbeat in what God wants to do. But you have the inspiration to do it, so you want to go and do it. But you have to be careful. Because Satan can enter in and also give you inspiration to do something. We have to realize that when we pray to God and, and we thank our prayers are answered, we have to also know that when our prayers are answered, if it's other than what God would want us to do, it's not from Him. I don't know where Rebecca prayed or not. I don't know what she said, what she did. I don't know where the money was in, that was involved with a, a reason for her making a decision. Well, she was presented with many gifts. And I like to think that even though the money, the money and the gold earrings and whatever were pleasing to her sight. That wasn't the main reason that she decided to go. And we go on with the story, we find as she got on her donkey and they, they headed to, to find Isaac. And as they were traveling along, there was Isaac in the field as we mentioned, and he looked up and he saw the camels are coming and Rebecca wanted to know, well, who is that man in that field? And the Bible tells us that when she was told that it was Isaac, her intended husband, that she got off of the camel and went to meet him. Don't know what was in her mind, what she was thinking. Was she wondering what he looked like as and as she got closer and closer, she could see him and make out his appearance. She could see what he looked like. But she'd made a commitment. She'd made a commitment to God. She made a commitment to herself to marry this man. You and I sometimes need to make commitments. We might need to make commitments to God. When we accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and the Savior, we have in reality made a commitment to Him, to follow Him, to serve Him, and to glorify His name. Many times we fall short. But the beautiful part about it is even when we fall flat on our face, it's God who is there to pick us up, to dust us off, and set us on the straight and narrow. How many today, I wonder, in our world, in our society, is committed totally to Jesus Christ? We claim to be Christians. Years ago, and I tell this, and I've said, told this before, a little bit of it, and I tell it in all humility, and I'll tell you why I say it in humility a little later, but I was sitting in Jerry's in Lexington, and it was a wintery day, snow and cold. I was sitting in Jerry's by myself, reading a paper, and two ladies came in. They sat down, and we began to talk. They asked me questions. We talked a little bit. Finally, one of them said, I want to ask you a question. And I said, well, sure, if I know the answer. 
He said, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, yeah. Well, let me ask you a question. Why would you ask me that? She said, because you act like one. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, what am I doing? I'm reading the paper. Then another time I went to meet a guy I had never met before, and he looked at me and said, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, yes. Why would you say that? He said, there's an aura about you. I looked in the mirror, I didn't see him. And then I had I was standing in, in the store one day talking. This lady came up, we were talking, and she said, You're a preacher, aren't you? And I said, Yes. She said, You look like one. And I'm sitting there, you know, what does a preacher look like? And the reason I said in humility, how many other times has someone looked at me and never even thought that? Maybe thought something different. What am I saying is that we as children of God should always reflect God in our lives. We don't always do that. I mentioned three times, three things. But how many other times through the years have people looked at me and didn't see that? Makes one wonder what kind of life are we reflecting to others? What do they actually see in us? I told the story in, here a while back about the man who invented the glasses called Esper Dog. And the essence of the story was that when the man really found, when a man really found out what the glasses meant. When he put them on, he looked, and what he saw was his true self, his inner being. And he committed suicide because he couldn't stand what he saw. In reality, Jesus Christ is looking at you and I, and he sees the inner, the heart. Remember the story of David? Samuel went to pick the new king and the oldest brother came out and Samuel thought here was the man because he was well built, strong, manly. And God said, no, no. And finally here came the little young boy and God said, that's the one I want. He said, I don't look at the other man. I look at the heart. And that's what we should do. We should not look at the outer person, the outer shell, but in the person's heart. And sadly, what we see a lot of times is not a pretty picture. When we who claim to be children of God live a life that reflects Satan, Rather than God, we're doing injustice not only to ourselves, but most importantly, to God. Rebecca made a choice. And for her obedience to God, and for her faith in her choice in going to marry Isaac, she became the mother of a great nation. Her name would always go down in history. for thousands of years. Sad, but when I die, I'll leave this world for it. How many people, how long will I be remembered? Oh, the family will remember me, but that's soon a fade. But what will they remember you for? The greatest legacy that we can ever leave behind, and I would I always thought that I would like to be able for people to say about me, he was a man of God, but I can't I can't think that they would at all times. It would be great, wouldn't it? 
that we could, as we passed and left this earth and went to be with God, that people said, well, they were a child of God. We see habitual words. Sometimes we see that here was someone who served God and, and he loved God with all his heart and he did great things. And other times we see somebody tell us all about a person's life, what they did, all the clubs that they belonged to, all the festivals that they went to, and all the great things they did in the world. But there's nothing about their faith in Jesus Christ. You can be the greatest person in the world. You can serve mankind, you can be a humanitarian, you can give all kinds of money to different organizations. But unless you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's not going to do you a bit of good. Only when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, only when we ask we back to put our faith in God and follow His command will we receive eternal life. Are you looking forward to your life with Jesus and your family? I had a cousin that passed away this week. I have a sister-in-law right now that's at the brink of death. And we wonder, did they really know John? I've done many funerals over the years. And some I've wondered what was their relationship with God. Sometimes you don't know. I hear people say, well, let's pray for them. Too late. When a person left this world, it's too late. You pray for them while they're still here. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Lord and our God, forgive us where we have failed you, for we know that we have failed you many times. Strengthen us, O Lord, as we walk the path of life in this world that we may not let this world overcome us, that we may keep our eyes fastened upon you, that we may keep our feet up on the path to everlasting life with you, that we may continue to serve you and we continue to glorify thy name in all that we say and do. Again, we pray for our nation. We pray, O oh Lord, that it may, as a nation, turn back to you. That we can truly say we are indeed a nation under God. Lead us to this day that we may glorify you. Forgive us of our trespasses. Strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.